Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leonard Jones. I'm a part of Buncombe County's Communication and Public Engagement Department here at Buncombe County. And I just want to thank you for coming out this afternoon to have this discussion. I think one of the key things to remember about the soil collection that's been unveiled here at the um, special collection here at Buncombe County is remembering those victims, documented victims of racial terror here. And the other step along with that is having a very meaningful dialogue around race and justice, especially just here and in our community. And so before we start, I would just like to bring honor and recognition to those individuals. Um, John Humphreys, 1888, Hezekiah Rankin, 1891, and Bob Brackett, 1897. These are the three individuals um, that experience racial violence and terror here in Buckley County. And so with the discussion of meaningful dialogue and race and justice here in Buckley County, we have three, sorry, we have two gentlemen here today that will um, have a discussion with us. We have Dr. Joseph Fox. He is a lifelong educator, mentor, and community advocate. And we also have Professor Jonathan McCoy. He is the director of of the Center of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Morris Hill, and a history professor as well. Welcome, Dr. Fox and Professor McCoy. Thank you. Thank you. And so my first question would be, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your connection to the Remembrance Project here in Buckley County? OK, well, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, I'm Joseph Fox. Uh, I have the, uh, I am a former vice president of the Martin Luther King Jr. Association of Asheville and Buckham County. And in late 2018, our board was discussing um, the uh, Equal Justice Initiative book, Just Mercy, and we were discussing uh, the work that the EJI was doing. Um, Mrs. Stevenson, Brian Stevenson had come to Asheville. The Mountain Express had uh, written an article about the work that was occurring. And so as we were having those discussions, we realized that individuals from the city of Asheville were also having that discussion. Individuals from UNC Asheville were, were having those same discussion. And uh, the group came to us and said, you know, as the, the leader around uh, Dr. King's legacy, will you all take the a role of the lead organization to work with the project. So at that time, I was named the chair of the Buckham County uh, Remembrance Project. We uh, housed the project under our COPE program, which is the Community Outreach Providing Empowerment, uh, which was, I was the original chair of that committee. And so it just made sense for our association to get involved with this particular project. And then I'm Jonathan McCoy, again, I'm Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, our center up at Mars Hill University. And so the easiest way to say it, I'm the new Dr. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm the Vice President of the Martin Luther King Jr. Association for Asheville and Buffalo County, and I'm the chair of our COPE program. So as you can see, I, he, he, he pulled, me, pulled me along. And so um, my purpose also with the um, organizations is, um, as a historian, is also to try to um, connect that history, connecting the past with the present. And so that's what I do a lot of times in, the, in um, our discussions and our work with the association of, you know, why is it significant for us to do these things? What, what is the meaning behind that? Thank you. So we hear Buncombe County's Remembrance Project. Can you give a kind of, what exactly was the Buncombe County Remembrance Project? So there, there are several components to the overall project, which we have completed at this time. So as I mentioned, this was a long-term uh, project starting in 2018. So the, the individual components, uh, there's a, a high school essay competition uh, where high schools get involved writing about some aspect of social justice. Uh, as to date, we are the only county that we had the largest number of participants from high schools uh, in the, the history of the project. We um, gave out over $16,000 uh, in scholarships uh, in which 
the Equal Justice Initiative sponsored about $13,000 uh, of, of that $16,000 and then our association kicked in another $3,000 uh, just because we had such a, a wonderful, rich uh, response from high school students writing about social justice. A second component is the um, soil collection that we'll talk a little bit more uh, about, but that's where we are asked to go to an area uh, where the actual hanging took place or, uh, or a place of significance. Could be where the court um, case was heard. In one of our cases, it was where uh, the end of one of the individuals were actually pulled off of the train um, and then taken and, and lynched. Uh, so the soil collection is, is, is where we collected the soil, uh, did a ceremony at the site, and then uh, an actual ceremony for the public. Uh, a third component is the actual historical markers. Uh, and so we secured three historical markers, one for each of the young men uh, of record. We do say the lynchings of record uh, because we know that many more lynchings took place, but these were individuals that had been documented. So we did the historical marker, and then the, the program ended with a trip to uh, Montgomery and, and several of the civil rights uh, museums, as, as well as the memorial and the uh, monuments uh, for the Equal Justice Initiative. And so there, there's, as you can see here, see and here, there are three parts to it, the remembrance of what happened but also it works for reconciliation. How do we, how do we heal from what we are remembering? And then there, the third part is that as we heal, how do we move forward? How do we progress? What do we learn from? Learning from remembering, healing, but then going forward anew. So we, we don't just return, but how do we um, basically renew or rejuvenate our community? So that's three tiers of what the project is trying to. And, and before we move on, I, I do want to recognize those individuals that are in the room that were uh, a part of one of the work groups or the, the uh, larger group. So if you would just raise your hand and kind of shake it up so that folks can see who was in the room that were part of um, the events. Uh, and you have to let it raise your hand. <laughs> and we also want to recognize our, our sponsors because, again, this was a long-term project. Uh, and, and so the city of Asheville, Buncombe County, uh, the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina, Dogwood Health Trust, and the Van Winkle Law Firm were all significant partners financially uh, in, in uh, this project where we were able to take folks to Montgomery for uh, almost free. You know, we asked people to pay one night of their two-night hotel room uh, as well as their meals. But the motor coach uh, was uh, covered, all of the entries to all of the various museums was covered, and then we still were able to cover one night of the two-night stay. And so I heard you mention where well, these are the documented um, victims of racial terror here in Buncombe County. You mentioned remembrance. So often when we talk about history, a lot of people want to say, show me data. So what, is, what was the process that either the Remembrance Project or EJI went through to verify um, these victims of racial terror? So uh, Sharon is here. Sharon, raise your hand again. Sharon was part of the research team. Uh, and so the Equal Justice Initiative staff, uh, and under the leadership of, of uh, the attorney Brian Stevenson, actually had gone through and uh, looked at the, here, the period of history in which the lynching project was going to take a, a part of. This was shortly after the Civil War where there was an uptick in uh, lynchings throughout uh, the United States, but particularly in the South. But uh, there, there were some that occurred in the North also. And so his staff of researchers, uh, to be included in the project, uh, actually had to find documentation of the actual court cases, newspaper clippings, archives, and so there had to be a paper trail um, of significance. And then our local research team uh, did additional research on the three individuals of records that were lynched uh, and actually found some 
some things that were different from what equal justice initiatives uh, found. So for example, uh, John Humphreys, we found, uh, our research team found two different spellings of his last name. So then we had to work with those staff as to which was going to be the, the actual name on the jars, on the monument uh, in Montgomery, et cetera. Uh, and so it had to be documented. We found a couple cases, and when I say our, we, our research uh, team, found a couple other cases, but it did not fit their criteria uh, in that uh, in one case, one event, uh, it actually had been a court case, uh, and the person was found guilty of a particular crime versus racial terrorism and lynching, uh, where people were accused of a crime but not proven. And then there's a time period, again, as Dr. Fox was saying, if you're looking post-Civil War, 1877 to 1950s is the, the time period they really concentrated on because, again, before 1877, you're having slavery where there are not really records are kept, of course, of sales, but not really individual records. And so there's more documentation in this time period that they're looking at because also we have to understand that lynching wasn't held in a vacuum. A lot of times they were big um, events for the community. Sometimes they knew that the lynching was going to happen. There was some, you can find instances where there was advertisement that, hey, Friday we're going to have the lynching of this person that we uh, have accused that something happened on Monday. You know, so there were, there were people that would gather for that. Some people would get dressed up. You can see in later years, especially in the 30s and 40s, that's where you're getting that documentation of pictures of people that would be in the newspaper. Also, um, as I was telling Leonard, um, one of the big things, if you go down to Dallas, um, they have African American Museum down there, and one of their displays is that um, a couple of postcards. It used to be big that they would send postcards. People uh, take pictures of lynchings and send them as postcards. And in, in, in that documentation, you can see the person who sends this postcard is writing, you know, hey, we went to this basic, we went to this event, and you know, this is what happens. And people also would take souvenirs from the people they killed. They would cut off their body parts and send them mail that, hey, here's the thing. So this wasn't something that um, just happened in the dead of night and nobody knew about it. Everybody knew about it. The town actively participated in it. And so the documentation is, is one of the ways, again, what was in the newspaper, what was in the written record, what is in somebody's diary that somebody might leave to the archives that you can read about. And, and the other thing I, I would piggyback on that is we're talking about these lynchings uh, and we say these men, one was 17 years old, one was 18 years old, and I think the other one was 28 years old. So these are young men, not even 30 years of, of age that were pulled from their homes uh, and, and lynched. So. And one thing that you'll, that you'll also see if you, if you really study this, that though here in Asheville we're talking about three young men, there were also women that were, that were lynched, and um, of course also even younger children, but especially in this, this time that we're looking at, um, we're about to have an election. One of the major things that are happening um, in, the time, in this time period that they studied, there were a lot of killings and lynchings that went on based on voting. And, and women that would go vote, well, black women would be killed, or uh, a black woman would speak out or seem to be um, too, too aggressive. Um, for, for what the, the standard was for society. So it was, um, unfortunately, uh, equal opportunity violence. Um, predominantly this, there was a large number of men, but you also have women, and then also you'll see, um, and if you research it after World War I, um, um, a lot of soldiers, there were soldiers that were men, they were still in their, in their uniform and just returned from fighting for the United States, and, and even into, um, you know, going into World War II, the same thing, coming back. And so you can see what was the terror behind it. But I think we had a question or comment. Um, well, I was just going to add that we were also looking for descendants okay. of people to try to get some stories. Right. And that can be hard if they're so young, there might not be, you know, them having children, but then do you have a family member? But also you have to think what was the, the plan behind the lynching is terror. So if your family member was lynched, you might, and you're from this area, the next thing you might want to do is 
move from the Arabs. One thing that's going to push that great migration that also happens that you have this move up to the north by so many um, African Americans is because of the terror of lynching. They had a family member or somebody close to them they knew or even a, a part of the community that was burned down. Why stay? This could happen to me. Let's move somewhere where maybe not. But again, it's also like Dr. Fox said, you go find in the north, there, were, there, there was terror there too. And one of the things that we added to our project was a series of, of healing, community healing workshops. Uh, because the, the terror that occurred during this period was not only personal trauma that were created, it was also community trauma, and now intergenerational uh, trauma, where you still have uh, uh, individuals of a Dr. Hugh, as I like to say, um, that don't feel comfortable coming downtown because a lot of these public lynchings were taken in places uh, right downtown in the public square where everybody came and had a picnic. And, and that goes to, again, that reconciliation because you have to have that healing because you do have um, community memory. Um, I, I, um, this project was interesting also because of um, a conversation I had growing up with my father. Um, he was born in Coastville, Pennsylvania, which was one of the place, the last um, lynchings that happened up north. There was a um, young man that was um, lynched in Coastville um, in 1911. And my dad tells a story, or he used to tell me about um, playing, growing up playing, and um, a white man would come down into the neighborhood and give the, the, the kids candy and money. And so one time he took some and he took it home and his grandmother slapped it out of his hand. I said, don't take anything from that man because he was part of that mob that killed that boy. That community memory that this is. So you think about where are some places we don't go, we're told growing up in a, in a community, don't go to that house, don't go down there. You know, oh, you know, that tree, what is the scar of the community that goes through the generations because that story gets told and told and told. Or that person or that family member is part of that group or things like that. So there has to be, if we don't have discussions, if there's not you know, in, embedded ways to work on how to reconcile, then that doesn't become a scar, it stays a wound and it continues to seep. <laughs> yeah, similar to that, you know, uh, in fact, I was visiting my dad in Charlotte last night, who is 94, uh, and when I started as the chair of this project, I had discussions with him uh, around his historical knowledge, and he said, well, you, you do realize that, uh, you know, that tree that's cut down in your grandmother's yard, there used to be a, a well there, and he said, you know, as, as he was growing up as a kid, there was a uh, gentleman in the community that were, he was, uh, you know, accused of, of doing something in the community, uh, whistling at a white woman or something. And so the mob came and they were going to lynch him. And he said, and your granddad hid him in that well uh, overnight until they could get him on a bus to Asheville and then on a train uh, out of this area. So that that community trauma, that community history and narrative uh, is, is still alive uh, and, and folks are experiencing it. So I hear you talk a lot about trauma um, and even just like community silence and not talking about it. I know uh, recently with the Tulsa race riots, they talk a lot about how even up to current day, some people do not want to talk about what occurred on that day, especially from their ancestors. So just here at uh, us in Buncombe County, did, did the Remembrance Project face any challenges as y'all began y'all process of gathering soil, placing where the markers are? Can you share any of that? Well, there were two that come to mind. <laughs> One, um, and, and Jim Stokely is with us today uh, with the Women uh, Dykeman Legacy. And so our third person today that was supposed to be with us is the president and founder of the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Association, um, Dr. Rowling Simmons, who um, uh, recently had surgery and could not be with us today. But uh, Jim is a local historian, and he uh, actually took Orlean and I on a step-by-step -step tour of the route that one of the victims uh, 
wall would have gone through. And it ended in a lynching at a, a, a private church uh, now owns the property. So the first challenge we had was that particular church did not want us to actually collect the soil from that area. So we ended up um, getting it from the old trail depot uh, in Ridgecrest uh, and, and taking the soil from there because that's where the um, sheriff realized that the mob was coming for the, uh, the individual. They took him out of the jail, put him on a train to try to get him to Raleigh. Uh, the mob realized what was going on, uh, intercepted the, tra the, uh, the uh, train and, and pulled them off and actually then occurred was the lynching. So that was one where in, in this project sometimes you have difficulty if something occurred on private property or if you're trying to put the marker on private property. Uh, the second one was COVID. Uh, you know, we, we started uh, this project late 2018. We had planned to kick it off with community engagement with the trip to Montgomery. We literally canceled the, the tour the week that everything went into lockdown. And so we then had to pivot around how do you engage the community, how do you communicate and educate the community on this project during a global pandemic. So Ron uh, Katz is with us today. Uh, Ron came on board, started doing a monthly e-newsletter to get communications out there. The MLK Association started posting stuff on the website. We uh, got a YouTube channel. Uh, we videotaped everything that we were doing. Uh, and again, trying to share uh, that information. We have a Facebook uh, account. But those were the two major challenges uh, that some of this occurred on private property and then also how do you continue to plan and implement your, your project during a, a global pandemic. And then, I, I know you have questions, so I'll let you ask your questions and I'll It's not a question, All but, right, you know, well, okay, I'll make it a question. <laughs> um, so what do you do when the white community is in denial because when I started doing my research and I'm asking, you know, this person, that person, they said, oh, we don't talk about that. And I, and I, well, I guess it goes to how I was going to answer it. As, as you go around to the exhibit, it becomes real. A lot of times we, we study history, we, we, we read book or you even see um, a film but it, it can be displaced. So you hear an event, again, unfortunately, when, um, you can think about what happened with George Floyd, but that happened way up there, it didn't happen here. You go around and all of a sudden you see that, that that's, that's dirt from here. That, that all of a sudden makes it real, there's that connection. But also you start to look and really, if you really start thinking about it, what are we denying? When, you know, a lot of times, and I tell this to my students, a lot of times we, we want to talk about white supremacy. And the first thing people are, well, you're, you're talking about white people. Well, no, we're talking about a, a way of thinking, a systematic. I said, when you break it down, you have to look at what is really, who's really being excluded? Who's really being attacked? Okay, white supremacy looks at that there is, there is a us, race, white. But there is an us of power, rich people. If you go back to that about where slavery and all this gets embedded, it was the planners elite, it was, the, it was rich people. So you were rich and you were white. But then the next thing when you look at gender was males. Rich, white, male. So that meant if you were a white woman, you had less power. If you were a poor white man, you were down. If you were a person of color, you definitely were down. But all of a sudden you're seeing who is, who is them. And so the white supremacy, so when you start looking at how are we divided between this us and them and what are the things and ways that we're finding to, to create that, then you ask, well, what are you denying? What, what don't you want to look at? What, do you, what don't you want to ex examine? If we're a nation that talks and, and, and really proclaims our equality, that everyone here has a right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but then if you look in our history and read it, that there's, you know, there's limits for women, there's limits for, for people of color, there's all these limits, then the reconciliation never happens. 
the wound never gets healed. So the, the visions that you have in your society that you're experiencing is because the wound has never healed and continues to weep. So the main thing, if you have that pushback, so you're happy with the discontent that's going on, the, 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 the visions that we're experiencing that we can't deny, you're happy with this reality? And if they say yes, well then, there's nothing here. If they say no, then you say, well, here's a way for us to actually work to, to heal that. And that means first we have to go through the rehabilitation. You know, the mending, if, if, it's, if your bone is broken, you know, the doctor just doesn't, okay, it, it has to heal. Well, if you've ever had a healing of a bone, that's, you know, it's not a comfortable healing. But you know at the end, when that cast comes off, it's been healed, it's gone through it. Well, we've been broken, have we gone through the healing pain? And that's what's that project, and that's the challenge. And, and I, just to piggyback on that, when, you know, I, I faced some of that initial pushback when we started this project uh, in late 2018, uh, yeah, I talked about the dominant versus the non-dominant culture. So really piggybacking on uh, what Jonathan is saying, where we talked about, well, dominant culture really was male-oriented. And it just happened to be uh, white males from wealthy families. But typically, if you looked at it, it was really very gender-based and economic-based. And so as you talk about that, I said, well, you know, let's just relate some stories. You know, what was the experiences that your, your wives and your mothers and your daughters experienced? And part of that was that supremacy. And that came from a place of a dominant culture versus a non-dominant culture. And then as Johnson is saying, there was a packing order. So if you were a white male from a wealthy family, uh, yeah, and I tie it to education. I, I was an uh, uh, educator for 30 years, and so I talk about the educational system and when did we finally let white women get a college degree and what were the professions that they were able to get into, you know, teachers, administrators, nurses, uh, which again, we still don't pay uh, what they are worth because we never deemed it a profession as a society. And then when did we let poor white men come in to the situation in terms of land-grant colleges and opening it up for education for the poor? Uh, and then, even then, we weren't letting people of color or Dr. Hugh into the system. So we had to have the creation of the uh, historical black colleges and universities. So when you just look at dominant versus non-dominant, and you start looking at the pecking order, you then start eliminating some of that pushback because usually you're talking to somebody that falls somewhere in that pecking order. We, we had a question or comment. Yeah, my question was, um, or actually, I think, I think you guys are going to Yeah, I, I was going to say that I think I grew up in Tunica, Mississippi, and uh, my family, uh, my, my father was a kid, he grew up in Quitman County, which was like an hour away from where Emmett Till was murdered, my dad was seven. And I remember him talking about his experience and the things that he, he saw as a seven-year-old child. And in my family, my great-grandfather, uh, Eddie Morris, was lynched. There's no documents of it, but that's what the family rumor is. And so what I always find when I talk to people, non-black or non-people of color, white folk, um, they usually say they, it's not more of a denial, because denial is more like, well, it's just, that's not true. That's just, it's more of a rejection of, I know this happened, but I, want, I don't want to, I want to reject this conversation because I don't want to be an outcast myself by even agreeing to have this conversation about something that occurred. And so it, it's been very heavy for me, I know, as a person who advocates in the community, and I am very, but I'm very upfront, and Leonard will tell you I, I don't sugarcoat anything. And I find I find a lot of folks who are ready to accept that they ask me more and they talk, and I'm, I'm very honest. But I think a lot of times it's just that that fear of if someone else who rejects this idea finds out that I'm in here, where does that put me? 
And that's real, you know, I have two books up here, you know, Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Initiative, you know, coming from, from him. He was the brainchild behind it and the drive behind it. But the other book um, is Blood and Unsigned My Name by Dr. Timothy Tyson, which um, deals with a, a lynching that happened down in Oxford, uh, North Carolina, as he's growing up. And he talks about the experiences, but he's looking at how did this lynching come about? What, how, what was this Jim Crow? What is the, this um, movement towards civil, civil rights? What is the impact in North Carolina? But Dr. Tyson is, is a white man. And so he's seeing it as a white child growing up and stuff, saying, you know, how could this happen? Why is this happening? Why are we, tra you know, and, and, he, and he talks about, you know, what happened to some white people that were seen to be too friendly with blacks? How the Klan went after them? Well, again, that's what lynching is all about. It's about intimidation. Well, hey, you might all of a sudden think, well, wait a minute, we are all equal, huh? We are brothers, we white or black, whatever color. Well, no. You're stepping out of line. So even even for for you know progressive whites, there was a danger. You know, his father loses his church because he was too much into trying to do too much for integration. So there is also that push. So again, that goes into that that understanding that white supremacy is not just oh well you know you're you're condemning white people and it's about what they did to black people. No, it's a way of life that stagnates the country stagnates the growth and stagnates the mind and it's affecting everyone, not just how it is affecting black people, it's affecting white society. And so the, the, the frustration comes is, hey, in white society, it's affecting you too. It's affecting the way, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, two of these men are lynched because a, a, a white woman accused them of, of something that's not proven. And the whole founding of the Klan was to protect white women. And I say it's always interesting about this all, oh, we're, we're doing this violence to protect women, but come time for North Carolina to ratify the 19th Amendment, North Carolina refuses because giving women the right to vote will open the door to allowing black people to think they're equal too. So all of a sudden they could join white women to black people, giving white women more freedom and equality is actually going to open the door for black people's freedom and equality. Well, if you're supposed to be protecting white women, why all of a sudden you're going to join them with the people that you already think are less than equal black people, unless it's about power and convincing people in different ways. You know, it's like a magician. You know, look over here so you don't see what I'm doing over here. That's what white superior is all about, it's magic. You know, keep you all stirred up here and you don't realize how I'm stabbing you over here. I know we have uh, another hand that was up, but before we, we leave the books, <laughs> the, the other book that I recommend that you read is called The Betrayal of the Negro uh, by Logan. And it, it traces federal legislation and presidential policies and procedures that kept the system and system biases in place. Uh, and it's really interesting to go from decade to decade to see how the policy, federal policy, federal law, kept these, these systems in place and kept people in place. Would you repeat the name of the book? It's called The Betrayal of the Negro by Logan, I believe. So, um, my first question is, can you say the name of the second book that you have up there? Blood Doesn't Sign My Name? Blood Doesn't Sign My Name. Uh-huh, by Timothy Tyson. All right. Um, my question is, as it relates to white supremacy or white ignorance, um, this system of power and affluence where certain families and groups of affluence are going to dictate how other people live and then that being tied to capitalism where they get to borrow and control my
Then there's the fluent and other black people who are dealing with some of the same issues, but there are these this paradigm of left or right. And oftentimes they have access but are afraid to speak. And oftentimes we don't even know that you're here and that this election is here. So have you done any extensive outreach efforts to go and engage with that group there? Um, whether it's you um, or just more so that they're not, not among black people who don't necessarily know the mechanics of how to communicate their voice, but they need this information. Okay. <laughs> that was deep. <laughs> so, personally, uh, so again, I, I was in the education system for uh, about 30 years before I took early retirement, and I, I now own my own consulting firm. But as a department chair, former department chair uh, at one of the local community colleges, uh, one of the things I started was a mentoring life coaching project for uh, particularly males of the Dr. Hugh, as I like to say. I, I don't like the term people of color. People of color lumps everybody that are non-whites together. So you will hear me say uh, people of a Dr. Hugh, people of a Dr. Tone, doc, people of a Dr. Pigmentation, uh, because you're, you're putting Asian, Hispanic, Latinos, Blacks, uh, I don't say African American often because unless you're from the continent of Africa and you don't have that African descent. So part of that is that re-education around what, is, what are we even talking about before you can get to those deep levels. But I started a mentoring life coaching project uh, where we went into uh, public housing, we went into joining partnerships with local advocacy groups that are already doing the work with uh, individuals of a Dr. Hugh. We went in with faith-based organizations. And so, literally as a formal department chair, there were times when a student came by and said, I can't even register uh, for this course, that I physically got up as a male of a Dr. Hugh, working with another student of, of Dr. Hugh, and walked that person to the next office and said, I'm not leaving until we solve whatever this issue is. Part of, of that program was uh, workshops on wealth creation. Because technically everything goes back to wealth creation. And so how do you break that cycle uh, of poverty and that intergenerational poverty of saying just because your, your parents and your grandparents grew up in public housing doesn't mean that you have to. But then removing those challenges and roadblocks in education that uh, helped them. And so, you know, one of the things that probably touched my life the most was I took a group of, Af uh, of uh, men of a doctor color students to a national conference um, in Phoenix that was sponsored years ago by uh, the Black Caucus. And in the first night of the conference, there were a room, it was a sea of blackness and darkness and calm of color. Uh, in the room, and they were all presidents of colleges throughout the United States. And one of the guys that had gone with us from Asheville turned to me, he said, I've never seen this many people with PhDs and EDDs, <laughs> doctors, that look like me. And uh, one of the speakers that night said, before you leave this conference, identify a mentor back in your hometown that you're going to reach out to. Well, this, this student emailed me that night before we even, you know, we had just checked into the hotel and said, I want you to be my mentor. And I wanted to make sure he was serious. And so I said, uh, you know, email me when we get back to campus, come by my office when we get, we get back to campus. Uh, he was there before I got there Monday morning. Uh, and so it takes people reaching back into the community. You know, I may be sitting up here today with a student tile, but if I'm going into public housing, I'm not in a student time. And in fact, the experience I had, one of the guys said to me, do not go into the community without me. And I said, OK. He said, I have street cred. And he said, I'm a, I will tell you, I'm a former gang member. But as long as you're with me, you're going to be safe. And so it, it takes reaching back out to people and not leaving them behind. Now, we do have a history of, as we have gotten better off, uh, monetarily, that we don't look back and pull somebody that next generation with us. 
And so it takes not only looking back, but it takes a core people, small group working together to say, hey, we're going to go back and we're going to do that. I'm, I'm from this area originally. I grew up in Tryon. Uh, I had moved away for college, moved away for jobs, but then one of the first things I wanted to do was come back to give back to the community. Now, we are very cliquish in Asheville, <laughs> in this region. And, you know, even though I was gone, I was from this area originally, coming back, I was still seen as an outsider. So then I had to connect with folks that are, were already doing some of the work, so from the economic piece of it, connected with uh, Stephanie Twitty, who uh, is the CEO of Market Street Development Corporation, a uh, black-owned nonprofit that looks at a mission of entrepreneurship. And so we partnered with the say, Asheville has a rich history of Market Street and Eagle Street and the historical block of the number of businesses that were black-owned in this community. And we started working with Community Pride and literally got a grant to do some free entrepreneurship training uh, you know, in various communities. So it, it takes that uh, to get over those challenges. Now, the, one of the challenges we faced was if you police a, a people enough, they will police themselves. Think about that. So sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we have been taught that you don't go here, you don't do this, you don't own your own business, you, you have to rent. And so breaking those intergenerational poverty alliances is really important. And you can see that's my passion. So I'm sorry. <laughs> well, so I think that it's worth to note on two notes. One, even Harper Street has changed their mission of point against just looking out for black people to make it again this everyone who is negatively impacted and has been negatively impacted. And so this this gets back to my question of for us young people who see that other groups are right, able to say, yes, we have pride in our own group, but then we live on with you all. They get to play community out. Take a strong eye, work with our own leads, and then we'll work with you. And then for us, we see that a lot of our leaders are on this work agate with left and right. And in other communities, it seems to work out differently, where left or right, they get something for their community. Whereas with us, even Market Street, the property that they own downtown, they start off as a black development that end up turning into affordable mixed use and everyone but us, and even I couldn't get in it. To actually get housing and so on, Stephanie Tilly, uh, that's my fiscal sponsor. I love them a lot, but this is just another example of a lot of times if we can't find solutions within left or right, and in Asheville it's usually left, then we have to big build a coalition in which our needs are pushed to the back. So that goes back to my question of did you come into these issues? Did you try to reach out to the community, that community that looks at a form of black folk who are in suits? Who are the leaders? And we look at you and say, "Oh, you're fighting for us." Have you had any outreach to them directly to say, "We're doing this, and we have this here"? And have you had any issues with it? Are there any opportunities for it now? Yeah. So this project was based on collective impact strategy, and so we the initial group was over 23 organizations. Uh, uh, my daddy taught me that. Kenan Lake was part of our. our outreach and part of our steering committee. Um, so we reached out to all who, uh, so first of all, I do a lot of equity training. Equity means access. That's really all it means. And so inclusivity means everybody has a voice. And so the principles that we, we built this project was on uh, uh, inclusivity, including everybody that wanted to be at the table, uh, reaching out to every organization, every faith-based group, every advocacy group, uh, and then inclusivity uh, around or access to, to what we're doing. So we, as we did that, we asked each of these groups to share that with their membership. Um, the uh, Justice Coalition, uh, the, my daddy taught me that, my sister taught me that, uh, youth, uh, the, the Libby Cows group, we reached out to everybody that we could throughout the city of Asheville and Buncombe County to say, hey, this is what we're doing. We want you to be a part of it. Our community engagement strategy was tell us 
what we should be doing, how we should be doing it, and who else is, should be at the table that's not at the table. And, and again, don't make the assumption because that we're sitting up here, we're from that affluent community. I grew up dirt poor. I grew up in a single parent household where we didn't have a heating system, we didn't have a uh, air condition, we had a pot belly stove that we as kids had to chop wood every morning before we went to school to keep the fire burning. So just because we have a title behind our name and we now have a suit uh, does not mean that we are part of that affluent uh, uh, community. Uh, and so uh, we, we tend to make assumptions based on what we see. Uh, so just, you know, FYI, uh, you know, again, we try to be as inclusive as possible. And I think also what you're talking about is a challenge we have to, as, as you do any of this work or, or trying to, to heal a community, you're, you're also in, um, you're in the pool. So what happens is, again, what we're seeing today right now, um, there, there are debates or a presentation that went to the Supreme Court talking about um, affirmative action. Okay, so, so you know, when, when you talk about politics, how, how do you talk politics? Well, in a lot of ways, we have to police ourselves because you, there's always the balance of how, how far is too far. You know, we can push, well, we, we need to do this. Well, wait a minute, you're going, you're going too fast. I mean, the team was going too fast. You need to wait. Wait for what? It's been a hundred years, what are you waiting for? So that, that also comes to the politics. But, and so what happens is when you are trying to bring about the change is the politics of how do you push that change, but also how do you push that change inside of a system that doesn't want change? But as you, as you learn, it needs change. So you're, you're finding that. And so then also as, as you're challenged, you say, OK, well, wait a minute. There's some people that have had a benefit, and there's some people that have been left behind. Hey, if we're people, how are you, how are you helping out? Well, we're also living in a society, which again, as you've talked about, we're, we're a capitalistic society which in, in, endears the individual. But to bring about change, you have to be endeared to the community. And so you're trying to change a commune thinking, a commune is different little sections, into becoming a community where the communes come together and unite. So you're asking people to actually think against what you've been raised and told that, hey, i got to look out for myself and the people I know I'm related to. But we're saying, well, as a society, you've got to look out for your neighbor also. And so that, that means the hard part, when, you, when you're being reminded and mindful and intentional about that and actually working, as Dr. Foss say, working for partnerships, but then keeping that partnership, as, as we start working together, we have to keep in mind what is our goal of community because it can easily get into, to slip back into what you've been immersed in that pool, that wait a minute, we're in this partnership, well wait a minute, we gotta worry about, you know, this is my name, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so it's the intentionality, which is hard for humans to do, because again, we're, we're short, you know, it's something, it's just like diet. You know, come first of the year, everybody's gonna have this new year resolution, I'm gonna do this, and by February 1st, we're not doing it. Because so many other things have started to happen during that month that takes away that focus. And so how do we keep that intention out? That's the hard part. And so you have to have those hard conversations to remind you of that. And say, well, what are we doing? Is that, and we might want that big goal, like you're saying, okay, it's multi loose but wait a minute, we might have to start first at this bottom where it's just us, but then that, that's hard. But wait a minute, you're, it goes back to that, um, Affirmative action. Wait a minute, you're excluding people. Well, wait a minute, but we're looking at people who over decades or centuries have been excluded. So there might be a way to, to even up that seesaw is for maybe for a little bit of time that they, they get some priority. But that goes counter to, to what we've taught. But you have to be mindful of that. I, I hope that answers your question, but I, I think you're, you're, you're asking a societal you know, how do we change society is, is by us being intentional and being mindful, mindfully in, in, in reminding ourselves of that and actually working for that and not getting lost in the horizon. And, and to remember that there's always, there, there are various alternative pathways to get to where you want to go. 
And so in the problem that I have faced or the challenges with a lot of these community groups, they are so in their silo of this is our mission, this is what we do, that their way is the right way and nobody else's way is the way to get there. And, and so you have to be a bridge to say, no, there are different, there are multiple pathways to get to the same place. How do we work together in a collective impact strategy to get where we need to go? Now, the other piece of that is society has ingrained within our minds that there are scarcities, scarcities of resources. So if I work with you, then that means there's less of the pie for me. And, and my thoughts are, if we work together as a collaborative, there's a bigger pie for everybody. So let's specialize in what you do best in your area, and then we provide wraparound services to community leaders, community folks that need all of our work, need all of us at the table, providing services that get you to where you want to go. And, that, and this, this is not a, a, a sidebar conversation. Wait a minute, we were talking about lynching and everything else, because that goes back into the whole idea of society. When you're, what, what was happening when these, um, when these three men were, were killed, they're at a point in society that is trying to be changed in North Carolina. Okay, wait a minute, you're, you're having that black, so now after hundreds of years of slavery, now all of a sudden they're, 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 they're free, they're able to vote and have, and have representation. Wait a minute, we need to put them back in their place and scare anybody else that's thinking of stepping over to get back into their place. So again, it's, it's like a river. We're trying to change the course, but what does a river, you know, you hear about all the time, what does the river try to do? It tries to get back to where it goes to. Well, that's what, the, and so if you're going to bring about change, this is, this, is the, this is the thing that was happening. So the change, the way people are thinking and interacting, these groups are interacting, the resistance that I think that you're talking about, there's a resistance to that, of a continuation, because you're trying to change what has been inherently learned over centuries. You know, that, that has been, that you see on TV, that you hear on the radio, that you see on the internet, you know, and, and I'll, I'll leave it with this. Think, <laughs> think, of, think of this. We know the pain of 9 11. Think how our society changed after 9 11. There was a point in time they were playing um, um, God Bless America on the radio at noon. Eight months later, or a year later, everybody was saying, well, yeah, we're going to do this. We got back to normal. COVID, we got to get back to normal. We didn't say, this is what's happened. How are we adjusting to the new way? We need to get back to the old way. That, 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 that is, that's a, well, no, there's a new way. Left. So what's happening here is after um, 1877, there's a new way of life. Slavery is in there. It's supposed to be a new way, but there's this push with lynching and violence and everything, denying of civil rights to get back to the old way. And how do we resist that? And, and I know we're almost out of time, so I'm going to leave you with my final thoughts around that, <laughs> around we're not trying to get back to the new norm. We're trying to get back to community. Yeah. And redefining what we mean by community. When you looked out for your neighbor, when you made sure that your neighbor had everything that they needed to be resourceful, uh, when you knew each other. You know, a lot of times I will get a question about uh, integration of the school system and was that a good thing or a bad thing. And I, you know, Growing up, as I see it in my opinion, it was a bad thing in that it took away that sense of community where the teachers looked like you, lived in your community, went to, to your place of worship, went to your community events. And so when you did it, if you feel short, they, they didn't have a problem saying, hey, I'm going to call your parents. Or I'm going to call, or they, they worked with your parents, or they saw your parents. And so, um, you know, we are trying to say with this project, and that's why it's called the Remember, Community Remembrance Project, to get people back to that sense of community and stop saying, I'm in community. Because what does that mean? You define community, but then put it in action where you're providing resources for people in your community, however you define community. Jonathan McCoy, um, just to be respectful of time, just do you have any final thoughts? 
I, I think it's, it's just like Dr. Fox was saying about community and his understanding where we're at. Again, I'm Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Center for that. We've always been a diverse society. North Carolina's been a diverse state. I mean, you know, Germans, Scots, Irish, Italians, you know, Anglican church members, we've had Quakers, Moravians, you can have all this diversity here. So it's been here as our state, as our country. You know, so this idea that we're just the sameness, we all just gotta get, you know, just be American. Well, this is the the mosaic that makes up America. And so understanding this, you know, this idea, well, wait a minute, you know, where do those people come from? They haven't been, they've been here, you know, whoever those people are, they've been here as long as your people have. And it's understanding that in the 21st century, you know, 2022 understanding that, wait a minute, this is who we are. So the lynching where it says, well, no, there's us versus them. People are getting out. They're not who we are. And so they deserve to be killed without any justice. They deserve to be minimized without justice. It's not something unique. Unfortunately, it's something American. So it goes back to intentionality. We have to understand that and actually work against going back that way. But it's easy to go back that way because if we think that, you know, they might get something better than me or we, we got to keep that from happening. So it's understanding the 21st century community that, yes, we're all made up of differences, but the differences by being aware of that and actually working with those differences makes us stronger as a community, as a collective. By denying that, it divides us and makes us weaker as a collective. Which way do we really want to be? And before I close out, I know we gather here today with the unveiling of the um, soil collection here that would be a permanent exhibit at the special collection. I just want to read this quote that's from Brian Stephen, who, um, who started the Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery, Alabama. And he said, in this soil, there is the sweat of the enslaved. In the soil, there is the blood of victims of racial violence and lynching. There are tears in the soil from all those who labor in the ignorant nation and humiliation of segregation. But in the soil, there is also an opportunity for new life, a chance to grow something hopeful and healing for the future. And so as we close out this day um, in this great discussion with Dr. Fox and Professor Jonathan McCoy, I'd like to thank y'all for participating in an event. And I think we reached our goal of fostering a meaningful dialogue around race and justice, especially here in Buckle County. And without further ado, I'd like to give a round of applause to our speakers today.